Welcome back to Econ 104, Introduction to Macroeconomics. Uh, today we're going to be taking a look at international trade and capital flows. To start off, this will be really a two-video series. So again, this is the first bit into this. Our goals as we move through this is really to examine, well, why do we have trade? Does trade make us better off? Is trade a good thing? Or, hey, is trade one of those situations where you have the winner and you have the loser? What, what exactly is going on with this? This is a politically heated topic. This is something that's right in our current events, in the world around us every day. Huge public policies, events, right? Things that are changing our lives. This is in the news. We are making decisions upon this. So important for us in that way there. What exactly are we going to be getting at today? Well, first we'll start taking a look at, well, like I said, why do we have trade? Is it good? From there, we're going to understand, we're going to take a look at Canada's trade situation. That is, we're going to take a look at their uh, Canada's trade balance. And then from there, we're going to move on and we're going to understand really this kind of weird accounting equality there. And that's known as that our current account is going to be equal to our capital account. And I say it's a weird little accounting thing. It's many people find it abstract. Many people find it not necessarily intuitive. Hopefully, with the example we work through and the way we phrase it, Hopefully you'll find that it's actually pretty straightforward once we kind of bring it down to a level that we can more easily understand. And in order to do that, though, we need to understand first, well, what do we mean by trade? So let's jump over. Let's take a look at that and let's get started for today. So as we said, as we said, what is trade? What do we mean by trade? Well, by trade, really what we mean is just any time we have an exchange of goods or services, right? And that can be then, in that case, there could be interpersonal trade. It could be me going to the store and buying a sandwich. It could be interprovincial trade, us trading BC, trading with Alberta, with Ontario, Saskatchewan, et cetera, et cetera. It could be international trade. It could be the trade between Canada and the US, Canada and China, Japan, UK, Europe, right? All of this is trade. So in that sense there, if that's all trade, the big thing to kind of keep in mind is that if we want to resist trade, if we're saying that, hey, trade is bad, well, think of what a world would look like without trade. What would a world look like without trade? If we had zero trade at all, right, go to the extreme other side of things, what would that world look like? And right, think about that just from your own personal perspective. Say you wanted a sandwich. It's lunchtime. You're hungry. You want to make a sandwich. How are you going to make that sandwich in a world without trade? Say you want a BLT. Well, in order to get the bread, even to start this BLT, well, you can't go to the store to buy it. That would be trade. Instead, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to plan this BLT a good year ahead of time. You're going to have to plant the wheat. You're going to have to raise the chickens for the eggs. You're going to have right? All of that. For the bacon, you're going to have to raise a pig. For the lettuce, you're going to have to plant the proper crops, right? You're going to have to plant lettuce for that. Same for the tomatoes. Then throw in the mayo, the pepper, all of that. And all of a sudden, this simple thing of, hey, I wanted to make a sandwich for lunch becomes an exceedingly difficult task that required months of forethought in a world without trade. So, Hopefully with that, we can kind of see the importance of trade. We can see that trade and the complexity that goes with it is hugely beneficial and hugely increases our lives and the gains we get in our day-to-day. -day. That is, hey, making a BLT sandwich, we hardly even give it second thought. It's just, yeah, okay, that's a pretty easy thing. We take it for granted. But the only reason it's so easy, the only reason we can take it for granted is because we live in this world where trade is so free and easy to accomplish, so free and easy to utilize. So, okay, that being said, that's the idea of trade. Let's take a look at a kind of our model to look at trade, to analyze trade, to analyze gains from trade and all that. For those of you who have already taken micro, you would have seen this already. This is our Ricardian trade theory. For those of you who have not, don't worry. We're just going to introduce the basic idea. We're going to have the overview of it. And really what this builds off of is the model we've already looked at, which was that model of our production possibilities frontier. That model of our production possibilities frontier. And let's say we're looking at the production possibilities frontier here for BC. And let's say BC can make two goods. 
they can make energy, and we'll say that energy is measured in gigawatt hours, or they can make agriculture. Agriculture, and we're going to say that that is measured in kilograms of agriculture. Probably more realistic, that'd be tons of agriculture, but uh, I already have it written down. What we'll presume is that BC's production possibility frontier, we're just going to presume a linear production possibility frontier, just for ease. We're going to presume it looks something like that. That is, on the one hand, if they put all of their resources into producing energy, they could produce 5 gigawatt hours. Alternatively, if BC were to put all of their resources, all their labor, capital, money, right, all of their scarce resource, if they were to put them all into agriculture, they could produce 10 kilograms. So, yeah, 10 kilograms, really. Yeah, maybe tons would have been better. Even then, both of these are pretty short from reality. Ah, but we get our idea. <clears throat> okay. From here, we've said already, hey, we can work out opportunity costs. So let's work out these opportunity costs. Let's take a look for BC here. Let's work out their opportunity cost of energy and their opportunity cost of agriculture. And right, keep in mind when we're talking about this opportunity cost, it's, hey, how much of one thing do I give up in order to get plus one of the other? And again, the way to kind of think about it is, hey, how much do I have to give up in order to buy a cup of coffee? Well, I have to give up $2 to buy a cup of coffee. So that is, if we were thinking about the cost of a cup of coffee, you would say, hey, that is $2 per cup. In the same way, if I want to think about, hey, what's the opportunity cost of energy production? Well, that would be how much agriculture I give up per energy. So that is, I could have my units here for energy as how many kilograms I give up for a gigawatt hour. Kilograms per gigawatt hour. In the same way we did dollars per cup up here. Agriculture then, well, same kind of idea. I want to know, hey, how many gigawatt hours do I give up in order to produce a kilogram? So again, how much of something I give up in order to get one of this? How many dollars I give up in order to get one cup of coffee? That's our idea there. Okay, opportunity cost, how do we figure this out? Well, keep in mind, over this linear PPF, we can just work it out as the slope. So in this case here, the slope is our rise over our run. So what is that? That's 5 over 10. 5 over 10, that's going to give me a slope of 0 0.5, right? One half. So one half what? Well, what, what rise was gigawatt hours, run was kilograms. So that's 0 0.5 gigawatt hours per kilogram. So hey, that 0 0.5, that's my opportunity cost of agriculture. So 0 0.5, right? That was how many gigawatt hours I had to give up every time I wanted to produce another kilogram of agriculture. To do the same thing, I could get the opportunity cost for energy production. It would just be the opposite. That would be run over rise in that case, or alternatively, one over this opportunity cost. So I would have an opportunity cost there of two. I'd have to give up two kilograms for every gig gigawatt hour produced. Okay, if BC was just operating alone in Canada, no trade with anybody at all, it was just entirely whatever we make in BC is what we get to eat, what we get to use, well, we have this whole thing where, hey, our production possibilities is no different than our consumption possibilities, right? And think about that, just going back to that whole example we started off with. Would you go through all of that headache of getting all that production you need to make a BLT sandwich? if you don't even like BLT sandwiches. Say you don't like tomatoes. Why would you go through producing tomatoes? Why would you put your scarce resources into making tomatoes if you don't even like them? Right? So in the same kind of way there, if we have a world without trade, your production will equal your consumption. You will only produce what you actually want to consume. So, hey, our production possibilities would be anywhere along this red line. And very similarly, wherever we choose, that would also be what we consume. But let's, let's talk about trade here. So in talking about trade, let's introduce another. 
let's introduce another and let's say we're talking about our provincial neighbor here let's say we're talking about Alberta so our neighbor to the east and again just for simplicity let's say that Alberta has the same industry right so they can produce energy that's gigawatt hours or they can produce agriculture and that's in kilograms what we're going to presume is that Alberta they could if they put all of their efforts, scarce resources, and energy production, we're going to presume they can only produce 3 gigawatt hours. Very similarly, if they put all of their labor, all of their resources, all of their capital, all of their scarce resources, time, money, etc. into killer, into agriculture, well, they would only be able to produce 9 kilograms. So, hey, right away what we see here is that BC is able to produce more energy than Alberta, NBC is similarly able to produce more agriculture than Alberta. That is, given their scarce resources, BC is kind of able to produce more of everything. Well, does that mean that there's no room for tra trade here? Does that mean that, hey, BC should just go along? They're better at doing this than Alberta is. We don't have any reason to gain from them, right? Well, no, that, that might not be the case. And in order to work this out, really what we want to take a look at is just like we did for BC here, we want to take a look at the opportunity costs of producing in Alberta. So again, to work out these opportunity costs, to start off, let's do rise over run. So 3 over 9, well, that's going to give me 0 0.33. Again, that's 0 0.33 what? Well, that's 0.33 gigawatt hours per kilogram. So hey, that's my opportunity cost of a kilogram of agriculture. So let's go and say for Alberta, opportunity cost of agriculture was 0 .33, 0 0.333, repeating, right? On and on and on. What about energy production? Well, that'd be the opposite, 9 over 3 to get kilograms per gigawatt hour. So 9 over 3 would be 3. So we would have our opportunity cost of producing energy. And what we see here is by comparing opportunity costs, that is not by comparing production amounts, not by comparing raw costs, right? Like our actual cost of, hey, how many dollars per cup, how many dollars per gigawatt hour, how many dollars per kilogram of agriculture. No, 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 we're not, we're not worried about these raw input costs. By looking at our opportunity costs and comparing these, we can work out which region has a comparative advantage. And if ever, if ever there's comparative advantages between regions, if ever that exists, we can have gains, we can have benefits. Both regions can be better off if we engage in trade. And what exactly do we mean by this? Well, comparative advantage means, again, forget about those raw, those actual costs of production, dollars per gigawatt hour. Think about it in terms of our opportunity cost. If one region has a lower opportunity cost, a lower trade-off of producing, we would say that they have the comparative advantage in producing that. So, for example, let's start off and let's take a look at energy production. So if we're taking a look at energy production, we're looking at between, okay, for energy production, BC has to give up 2 kilograms to produce a gigawatt hour. Alberta has to give up 3 kilograms to produce a gigawatt hour. That is, between these two, BC has to give up less agriculture to produce energy. So that is, we would say that BC has a comparative advantage in our energy sector. So what we can do is we can just kind of go, okay, this guy right here, that's, that's the one for our energy who can produce energy relatively cheapest. They have to give up the fewest amount of alternative resources. What about agriculture? Well, if we take a look at agriculture, we're flipped between 0.5 and 0.33. Well, okay, in this case here, we see that Alberta has the lower agriculture opportunity cost. That is, they have to give up less gigawatt hours in order to produce an extra kilogram of agricultural goods. So Alberta would have the comparative advantage in agriculture.
Okay. If ever this case arises, if ever there's a difference in opportunity costs such that we'd have comparative advantages in goods, what this, what this trade theory suggests is that each region should begin to specialize in what they're best at. So that is BC should specialize in energy production. And given our linear production possibility frontier, that means that they should go all the way into producing only energy. Alberta, Alberta is best at agriculture. So similarly, Alberta should go all the way in producing only agriculture. Okay, so if that's the case, each one specializes all the way in each one. Well, okay, great, but hey, I'm in BC. I also need some agriculture to eat. I can't just eat energy. So how do I trade? And at what rate do I trade? And by trading at this rate, am I actually better off or worse off? So, okay, in that sense there, let's talk about BC. And let's start off first by talking about we're producing this energy. We're producing five gigawatt hours of energy. Am I going to sell this? What price am I going to sell this for? And at what rate am I going to get rid of it in order to obtain agricultural goods, kilograms of agriculture. So the way we can explore this really is to focus in. Let's focus in here on just our energy costs. And so in terms of kilograms per gigawatt hour, what we want to ask is if we were BC, what would be the minimum rate or the minimum price that we would be willing to accept WTA willing to accept um, to sell our energy. So for energy, what is the lowest rate, the lowest amount of kilograms that I would accept for a gigawatt hour produced? And in this case here, you're like, uh, I, I, I don't know. Well, okay, we've got to think about that from their perspective. For BC, it costs them two kilograms in order to produce a gigawatt hour. That is, that's their cost of production, two kilograms per gigawatt hour. That is, if BC wanted to, they could get their own agriculture by just giving up some of their gigawatt hours, right? So in this case here, each gigawatt hour is worth to them two kilograms of agriculture. So at minimum, what price are they going to sell their gigawatt hours for? Well, at minimum, their minimum willingness to accept would be two kilograms for a gigawatt hour of electricity. That's the lowest price they would say. Like if Alberta was like, yeah, okay, hey, BC, we'll give you one kilogram for one gigawatt hour. BC would say, nope, sorry, I can do better on my own. At a point where right? if Alberta was like, we'll give you two kilograms per gigawatt hour, well, BC is like, well, I'm not any worse off. I'm not better off, but I'm no worse off, so maybe. Alberta says, hey, we'll give you five kilograms per gigawatt hour. Well, BC is pretty happy with that. BC is saying, wow, that's a lot better than we could do ourselves. So, yeah, okay. Okay, we'll take that. We have a cost of two kilograms per gigawatt hour. We're getting five kilograms per gigawatt hour. Ho oh, we're making three kilograms off of every gigawatt hour of electricity produced. BC would be pretty pumped about that deal. Okay, so we have our minimum willingness to accept, the minimum price in which we'll trade at, so to say. On the flip side then, we need to work out for Alberta, what is their maximum rate? That is, we would say, what's their maximum willingness to pay? What is the highest price that they would pay? How many kilograms at most would they give up in order to get a gigawatt hour of electricity? Well, in this sense here, again, we can go back to Alberta's opportunity cost, and we can see that, hey, Alberta can produce their own energy at a cost of three kilograms. So that is... If Alberta were to buy energy from BC at three kilograms of agriculture for a gigawatt hour, well, 
they'd be no better off, but they'd be no worse off either. If they were to buy it for that five kilograms, well, Alberta shouldn't do that. Alberta can produce their own energy for only a cost of three. To buy it for five would be ridiculous, right? It'd make no sense. It'd be cheaper to do it yourself than to buy it from somebody else. So in this sense here, the maximum price that Alberta would pay for a gigawatt hour of electricity would be three kilograms of agriculture. So we would get a maximum price of three kilograms per gigawatt hour. And what we see is we see that there's actually room to negotiate between BC's minimum price to sell and Alberta's maximum price to pay. As long as there's room to negotiate between these two prices here, between these two points, both regions, both regions can be better off. Both regions can have gains from trade. And both regions will be significantly having higher levels of consumption than they had before. And hey, higher consumption, that's higher standard of living, higher quality of life, more available to you for the same resources being put in. That's a good thing. So, okay, for simplicity, let's just say that Alberta and BC, they negotiate, they negotiate a trade price of 2.5 kilograms per gigawatt hour. And again, I just picked the middle point there, right? I said, hey, right in the middle between two and three, 2.5, cool, there we go. That's gonna be our trade price. That's gonna be the rate at which we trade gigawatt hours for kilograms or kil kilograms for gigawatt hours. Okay, so if we wanted to show this trade price, this point here on our diagram, we can do that and we can do it quite readily, but ah, issue. We decided to take a look at prices in terms of kilograms per gigawatt hour, kilograms per gigawatt hour. Right now our lines, well, they're the inverse. They're in terms of gigawatt hours per kilogram, right? 0 0.5, 0 0.333. So, oh man, everything we just worked out in terms of slopes is the reverse of what we're dealing with. Well, we can fix that quite easily, right? If this is our trade price, how many kilograms we give up for a gigawatt hour, we can get the inverse quite readily. We can figure out the trade price for a kilogram by going one over 2.5, right? That's one over kilograms per gigawatt hour. That's gonna give us 0 0.4 gigawatt hours per kilogram, right? That just gives us boom, the flip of the opposite cost. So, hey, if we're trading 2.5 kilograms of agriculture for every gigawatt hour of energy, well, conversely, we're trading off 0.4 gigawatt hours for every kilogram of agriculture, right? Just the inverse of that. So what exactly does that work out to? Well, let's take a look here. 0.4. Let's go to BC to start off. Hey, NBC, I could trade off my own energy to agriculture at a rate of 0.5. So that is, if I were to move away from energy and towards agriculture, I'd be moving along this red line at a rate of substitution of 0.5. But if I'm trading, I can trade at a rate of 0.4. So hey, 0.4, steeper or shallower than 0.5. Smaller number is shallower. So that is... Starting at this point here, I have a shallower line such that that is 0 0.4 gigawatt hours per kilogram as my slope. And this green line, this would be my trade line. So that is by trading at this rate, I get to consume at any point along this green line. Keep in mind before trade, I was stuck on this red line. I could only produce and consume on the red line. Now with trade, I can produce what I'm good at and I can consume along this green line, which is higher and above the red line, meaning I can consume more stuff by specializing in what I'm best at. What about Alberta, right? BC wins, Alberta loses. That's, that's the way it goes. But no, 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 no. Trade is not zero sum. It's not one person wins with trade and one person loses. It's actually both parties can win from trade. And let's take a look at that. 
So, okay, starting with what Alberta's best at. Currently, Alberta could give up and at the rate of 0.33, switch between gigawatt hours and kilograms. But in this case here, our trade line is at 0.44. So, okay, bigger number means steeper, right? 0.4 is bigger than 0.33, so it's steeper. So starting at our specialization point, we're going to have a steeper trade line. That is, again, at 0 0.4. That's the rate of trade. And again, what we witness is that by focusing our production, by specializing on what we're best at, what we have a comparative advantage in, we can then trade at this better price and obtain higher levels of consumption than were previously available to us. So in this way here, by working out a trade price that is in between, right, by focusing on our comparative advantage, working out a trade price in between, both parties, both regions can actually be better off by engaging in trade by getting a higher level of consumption than would otherwise be available to them. And that there is the crux of the argument, that there is this whole idea of our gains from trade. We can focus on what we're best at. We can then, hey, because we're best at it, we can produce it relatively cheap. We can sell it for a little bit more. And then with that profit we've made, we can use that profit to buy the other stuff. And we can buy that other stuff cheaper than we could do it ourselves because somebody else who's really good at doing it and can do it really cheaply, well, they're the one making it. And so we can buy it from them for a cheaper price than the cost of doing it ourselves. Hence, the gains from trade. Okay, that's the idea of our gains from trade. That's what's going on there. That's really the crux to say, hey, yes, trade makes everybody better off. Trade is good. That's really all we're going to get into with this bit with Ricardian trade theory. From here, we're going to move on to more of the macro discussion of trade. We're going to be taking a look at trade balances. That is our net exports. We're going to be looking at the flows of international capital and international goods and services. This is kind of just that, hey, bit of micro introduction to show that, hey, we do win. Trade is actually good for all parties involved. So to preface this, let's go take a look at Canada's trade balance. Let's take a look at what Canada is doing and see if we can identify based off of that, based off of what we're trading, what our comparative advantage is. So let's go jump over. Let's take a look at that. Just again, that head warning, we're dealing with a black screen right now. We're going to jump over to uh, internet browser, so it's going to be white. It'll be a bit brighter. If you need to take that second to adjust your brightness, if you're in a dark room, I don't want it to be that shock to you. So just the heads up, we are about to get quite a bit brighter here. So let's go jump on over. Okay, so here we have a bunch of information about Canada here. We have, based off of this, right, okay, economic complexity, we don't need to worry too much about that. All of this data is more or less as of 2018. We see that, hey, we exported 431 billion worth of products. Our exports per capita, right, so exports per person, was about 11,000, 11,500. We imported 370, and therefore we had a imports per person of about almost 10,000. So, right, we see, okay, in this case here, for products, that is goods, things we've made, we've been a net exporter. We've been exporting products to the world more than we've been buying from the world. So, hey, in that case there, if I'm exporting goods, well, hey, if I'm an exporter, that means I'm producing goods. Well, that's kind of saying that if we think about it in this generic kind of simple way, Canada has a comparative advantage in this goods production because we're selling goods to the world. Now, what about services? We see here for services, okay, we exported 80, almost 83 billion worth of services, and we imported uh, almost 110 billion worth of services. So, okay, in this very simple case here, we had a comparative advantage in goods, so we sold goods to the world, but we see on the flip side of this here, we on net bought services from the world. So we had a comparative advantage in goods, that's what we sold, we don't in services. So we've been importing, we've been buying services from others. So we see that in a generic way, but we can kind of break this down farther. We can take a look at, okay, well, what goods, what services exist, which ones are we actually trading? And so let's go take a look down. 
As we scroll down, there's a bunch of interesting things here. Really what I want to take a look at is this guy, this guy right here. There we go. So what we have is, let me just make sure. Yep, we have our exports. And let's take a look at trade value. Let's just wait for that to update there. Okay, so focusing on here, our product exports as of November 2020, we see out of all of our trade, out of everything going out to other countries, we see what's our big areas. And so we see, hey, the big one, 12% of our total trade is crude petroleum at 5.16 billion. Right, we then can go through that and you see all together, all this red is mineral products, raw resources. We see the breakdown of all of that as you go through. Next biggest, next biggest export is carbs at 10.1% of our exports. And we see, okay, we go having that vehicle parts on and on and on and on. So, okay, there we go. We see our two biggest exports, crude petroleum and carbs. Well, what we can also do is we can compare that to our imports and let's go jump and take a look at that just up here switch this guy to imports and as we jump to imports we get well what we're importing from the world on whole and you see okay what's our biggest import well hey we see our biggest import is also cars well that's kind of funny we just said hey canada's a net exporter or not a net exporter but rather an exporter of cars but yet here we are buying cars as well Hey, if we went back and just took a look at that comparative advantage theory we were just talking about, it's saying that, hey, we should specialize in what we're good at. And if we're producing and selling cars, clearly we're good at it. So shouldn't we just be selling and producing cars? Why are we buying cars from other places? I mean, even over here, 12% of our exports were crude oil. We see here that we're also buying almost 2%, almost 2% of our imports are crude oil. So again, hey, if we're good at it, if we're selling so much oil, why would we buy oil as well from other places when we're able to produce it here at home? What's what's going on with this? Why, why is this the case, right? So really the basic idea behind that, the premise as to why this is the case is that, well, that model we just took a look at, that whole Ricardian trade theory, it's not exactly true. And the reason why it's not exactly true is because we made a very simplifying assumption with that linear production possibility frontier. In reality, as we've seen, that production possibility frontier is concave, that is it's bowed, and in being bowed, right, and we can go and we can take a look at that, and it, in reality, being bowed, let's, let's draw that. With it looking something more like this, we have changing opportunity costs depending on where we're producing, right? The more of one good that we produce, the higher the opportunity cost of that good becomes. And so what happens is we never go all the way to this corner solution, or very rarely would we ever go all the way to this corner solution. That's all we produce. Instead, what's more likely is that say we had a comparative advantage in cars versus other stuff, well, we would begin to increase our production of cars. So as we increase our production of cars, our, compare, our, our opportunity cost of producing cars becomes higher and higher and higher until our, our opportunity cost of producing cars is one and the same as the opportunity cost of our trading partners. That is, we keep producing cars until that point where, hey, we're no longer any better at producing them than our neighbors. But we're producing a lot more than our neighbors are. So in that case there, we're producing a lot more than our, we could ever consume locally. So we begin selling them off abroad. But hey, keep in mind, even though we started to focus, even though we started to specialize in car production, we never completely destroyed this stuff industry either. It contracted, it shrank, but it didn't go all the way to zero because cars didn't go all the way to 100%, right? Bit of contrast to this BC Alberta case where we went, hey, all the way to energy, 
destroying the agriculture sector. All the way to agriculture, destroying the energy sector. No, no, in reality, that doesn't happen, right? In reality, we just specialize, we move, we focus. One sector contracts, but isn't destroyed altogether. And that's what we see. So then what happens is, okay, sure, we're specializing, we're focusing on our car production. So we're exporting a lot to the world on whole. But hey, as we're selling these to the world on whole, our opportunity cost of producing is no different than the world's opportunity cost of producing. As a result, our raw price, our actual price in terms of dollars per car, would really be no different than the price anywhere else in the world. This whole bit here, this ends up being ultimately known as the law of one price loop. Law of one price. And really what this says is that any traded, any globally traded good or service will ultimately converge at one global price. And really as that begins to happen, well, we're now looking at cars. Canada's producing lots of cars, so we're selling them abroad. And let's say that the law of one price dictates that the price globally of a vehicle is $20,000. And again, to be very, very simple, let's say that, hey, a vehicle produced in Canada, let's say Toyota Canada, is no different than a vehicle produced in Toyota USA. That is, they're both just Toyota Camrys from your viewpoint. You don't notice, hey, the ones produced in Canada are better or the ones produced in the USA are better. They're, for all intents and purposes, identical. Well, in that sense, it doesn't really matter which vehicle you buy. If you buy that Canadian-made Toyota Camry for 20000 well, then great. Canada made a bunch of cars. You're just buying a domestically made Toyota Camry. If you're in BC and all the production of Toyota Camrys are out in Ontario, well, maybe it's easier to buy a Toyota Camry from right across the border in Washington State for, again, that same price of 20000 so as a result, you end up importing an American Toyota Camry and, well, it's the same price. So it doesn't matter, right? So this way here, as soon as you focus on trade, as soon as this law of one price prevails, well, we would say that, okay, Canada's specialized. Canada's now has a comparative advantage. They're going to produce and they're going to export cars. But really what that means is they're going to be a net exporter of cars, Based off of convenience, based off of location, sometimes it's going to be easier to import a car than to buy a car domestically from across the country. So ultimately, in reality, all we truthfully are is a net exporter of cars, not a full exporter. That is this whole bit on the left where we completely specialize. That's a bit, it's a bit wrong, right? It's a bit of an exaggeration. Okay. Let's also take a look at Canada's trade balance. That is our relationship between our exports to our imports. How much stuff we sell versus how much stuff we buy from abroad. So taking a look at the trade balance, that is that comparison, that net exports, that exports minus imports, we can take a look at where that's been sitting at for Canada. So keep in mind what we we're just looking at earlier was just these product imports or alternatively product exports. Or November 2020. So that is our most recent data that we had as of the time. All right, there we go. We have exports for the same time period. If we continue to scroll down, what we get is what we get our yearly exports. So last one that we had was 2018. We see, okay, we as a proportion of all of our exports, we had a lot more crude petroleum, 15.5%. Out of all of our exports, who was our biggest trading partner? Who did most of this go to? Well, the United States, big neighbor right next door to us. So yeah, where most of it goes to. Carrying on down, right? You see cars, most all of that, same kind of idea. Yearly imports, again, same kind of idea. Biggest yearly import was cars again, even though, hey, that was also our biggest export. And then again, petroleum, even though again, that was a big export. So just like we were talking about with that whole bit of uh, we're a net exporter of certain things, a net importer of certain things. And again, who's the biggest trade partner in terms of the person we buy stuff from? Well, again, the U.S. followed by China and really this big Asian trade 
partnership there. Okay, what we really want to take a look at though is our monthly trade. And unfortunately, given the update that they've done on this site, they've actually made this really small. This used to be a lot bigger. This is our monthly trade and let's see here. We have our imports in red and we have our exports in blue. What we really see and really the goal of this as to what we see is that our exports and our imports, they actually mirror each other pretty closely. That is in some months we have a trade deficit. That is where our imports exceed our exports. We buy more stuff from the world than we sell to the world. And then in other months that switches. But ultimately, if we were to take a look at this trade balance or this level of trade, sorry, not level of trade, this trade balance, how much money we have in our net exports, we see that in a lot of months, this is actually pretty close to zero. Exports and imports very nearly cancel each other out, right? Even though we're talking about huge amounts, we're talking about, hey, 36 billion and right, very similar amounts. We have 32 billion worth of exports. Even though that's quite a bit of volume of trade, well, the difference between them are often quite close to zero. And we see, right, we see with everything being shut down during the pandemic, we see trade collapsing at the same time. So all of this to show just kind of what's happening with Canada, what our current situations are, what kind of stuff we're trading, and what all of that looks like. Okay, so that does us for this video. What we've taken a look at so far is we've taken a look at this idea of trade. We've taken a look at the Ricardian trade theory and shown, hey, we do have gains from trade. We are better off if we engage in trade with one another. And we took a look at that by taking a look at our comparative advantages and saying, hey, we should focus, we should specialize on what we can produce with the lowest opportunity cost. From there, we kind of worked out this whole price of trade, and then from that price of trade, we could obtain a trade line and saw our gains from trade that we can actually increase our consumption by having trade occur. We jumped over then to the OEC website here to take a look at Canada's trade situations. We took a look at situations where Canada was a big exporter, Canada was a big importer, and we identified areas where Canada has a comparative advantage. We said that on whole, Canada has a comparative advantage in goods, right? We exported more goods to the world than we imported. That is, generically, we're better at producing goods than we are services. And then more specifically, as we started to boil it down, we witnessed that, hey, in our trade balances, Canada had a export, a net export balance in crude petroleum and cars showing us that, hey, we actually have a comparative advantage in this raw resource, petroleum, oil, and in vehicle production. So comparative advantage in those. Attached to that, we saw that, hey, in reality, we're dealing with those concave production possibility frontiers, meaning that we're not completely destroying an industry by focusing on what we're best at. We're just growing an industry that we're best at, shrinking an industry that we're not so good at, able to sell the stuff we're good at for a high global price, import the stuff we're not so good at, we can import it cheaply by paying other people to do it because they're better at it, and by selling stuff that we're good at for a high price, buying stuff we're not good at for a low price, we obtain our gains from trade. We saw though with that, that given that concave PPF, we settle on this one price, this one global price, that was our loop, our law of one price. And as a result of that, right, we're not just purely an exporter of cars. Well, we're also an importer of cars as well. Because once that world price is hit, once that world price is recognized and opportunity costs are equated, well, it no longer matters if you buy a Canadian car or an American car, a Canadian car or a Japanese car. Because end of the day, it's just a car and the price has equated globally. So that was the idea behind this video, really taking a look at that, taking a look at Canada's balance and why we have these benefits from trade. If you have any questions on anything we covered through this video, please feel free to comment below. Feel free to reach out to me, post on the Frequently Asked Questions board, or shoot me an email. Thanks. Until next time.